Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 194 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, who this week is offering my first FCPA Masterclass training. Uh, FCPA Masterclass is the ultimate nuts and bolts compliance program course. It is being offered on September 10th and 11th in Houston, Texas. I have a few slots available. If you'd like some more information, please contact me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. But today, in this episode, you are in for a real treat because I have back with me Maurice Gilbert. Maurice is the principal of Concilium, one of the country's top compliance chief compliance officer search organizations. Maurice continues in part two of his three-part series on hiring in compliance. Today he talks about the work that he and Concilium do to source candidates for companies who are looking for a chief compliance officer and compliance practitioner, and the presentation of the offer to potential candidates to get them interested. The episode comes in at just uh, under 22 minutes. As with uh, part one, it is packed with solid information that you can use going forward. It's very informative. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for listening. Report. Today, I am continuing my conversation with Maurice Gilbert, the CEO of Concilium Executive Search. We are in a multi-part podcast where we are exploring the hiring process, basically from A to Z. We talked in our last episode about what a company needs to do to get ready uh, to bring on board a senior executive, uh, chief compliance officer or, or other C-suite executive. And today we're going to visit about uh, Maurice's thoughts on the sourcing of candidates and the presentation of the offers to candidates. So Maurice, uh, thanks uh, so much for taking the time to, to visit with us again. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Tom. And uh, what uh, is the step uh, around sourcing of the candidates? You gave us a little taste of that in our last episode, but uh, I'd like to really explore that in, in more of a deep dive today. You bet. Well, <clears throat> in our last conversation, we talked about developing the profile, and that's done in conjunction with the client in what we call a kickoff meeting that could last up to two hours. Now, the sourcing of the candidate, what we're going to talk about today, uh, that's a function of, in part, we do ask our client in the kickoff meeting, are there any particular competitors that they wish us to source professionals out of are there any particular competitors or companies that are hands-off that they do not want us to recruit out of? Hmm. So okay. that, conver that conversation is, is done with the client in the kickoff meeting. Now, once we have those data points, then I take this back to my team, and we – develop a sourcing strategy. And by that, I mean we have to make a determination as to where we're going to find the profile of the professional that we've developed. So the best thing to do here is to do an illustration. We were doing a, we were asked to do a search for a pharma company and they had a facility in Ohio, and they wanted a compliance professional to be in Ohio. Well, that is problematic. Why? Because most of the pharma companies <clears throat> are in the Northeast Corridor, New York, New Jersey. And then you have a small uh, cadre of, of companies in Chicago. So we thought, okay, this is Ohio. There are no pharma companies in Ohio. Where, where are we likely to uh, get this professional? Well, it's very problematic to recruit an East Coast person to Ohio. 
or anywhere else for that matter. They're usually <laughs> entrenched. <laughs> yeah, they're usually entrenched on, in the East Coast. You can't even get me so, to go east of Dallas, so that makes sense to me. Exactly. So here's how we approached it. We thought, okay, we have to find somebody who has some roots in the Midwest. So the way we went about this is we thought, okay, well, we're going to be very aggressive in our marketing to people presently in Chicago because that was the closest vicinity and and people that already understand the Midwest culture and are probably happy to be there. So we, we were very aggressive in trying to recruit people out of Chicago. But the other thing we did was <clears throat> with our entire network of professionals that we're familiar with, we went back and we looked at people that may be on the East Coast or the West Coast, but maybe they went to a university in the Midwest, or maybe they have family. That's where they started, you know, and grew up in the Midwest. So we looked for professionals who had some touch point with the Midwest also, uh, even if they may have been in in another on either coast let's say so that was very very strategic um, and as it turns out ultimately we did recruit somebody out of Chicago but we again we were also able to visit and have some very good dialogues with people let's say in New Jersey who went to school in Chicago or something like that who were receptive to looking at this opportunity so again, you have to be very, very strategic um, to develop a uh, a sourcing plan, a strategy, let's say. So after you've developed the, the plan and strategy, is that something that you communicate back to your client, or then do you uh, try to to field or, to, or take a look at potential candidates, really what's the next step for Concilium and you? Okay. So once we develop the, the sourcing strategy with our team, we don't need to articulate that to the client. They don't care. They just want us to go out and get the right people to, to review. Mm -hmm. so, in, so once we develop our strategy, then – we develop our selling points, our, what will be our presentation to a, a professional. And those selling points will include, among other things, we have to talk about the attractiveness of the location, the city. We have to talk about the attractive features of the company, of the opportunity, of the hiring authority, et cetera. So we develop, and even this takes hours of research, to develop, you know, attractive talking points uh, to articulate the value proposition of this opportunity. So once we develop our presentation points, then we're ready to go to market and start our messaging. And here – it's developed into basically two categories. We develop a, a target list of professionals that we believe will be a possible candidate. We don't know for sure because every opportunity is, is different, and we don't know if the, the, even if an individual is interested, but we develop – what we believe to be a target pool of, of professionals. The second thing we do is we develop a pool of professionals that we know cannot be a possible candidate, but they could be a referral source for us. Mm. So we develop these two pools, and then we start our presentations and we, we present it differently based upon if, if we're targeting somebody 
to be a candidate versus if we're targeting somebody to be a referral source. Those conversations, uh, you know, are a little bit different. And at this point, uh, when you're ready to make your presentation, um, or is is the next step after you make your presentation, uh, then taking a potential possible or selected candidates to your client for consideration, or where do we go from here? Or where do you go from there? <laughs> well, <clears throat> once we make the presentation, then we have to, or the, the the presentation of the opportunity is is the first thing. But then as we're talking to the candidate, and here's what, where we get into our next module that you and I want to discuss is how do we – what's next? And what's next is now we have to screen the candidate to see if they're qualified and interested in the opportunity. Well, let me stop you there because um, knowing knowing you and your company, the folks that you work with typically are, are highly technically competent. There's not Correct. a people or a group of people in the concilium world that are not technically competent. So right. how do you separate out uh, a technically competent or uh, from other skills that are needed uh, for your clients? Well, that's a great question because really what we have to get to the heart of is what does the client need at that particular point in time? And what I mean by that, again, this is best done in an illustration. We had a client who asked us to do a search in Europe, um, and it became apparent that the, the profile of what they were looking for is someone who was very fluent in investigations. They were having um, issues, and they were doing investigations throughout the EU, Russia, and even into China. So that was a focal point of, of what they needed at that given point in time. So when we were looking to um, screen professionals, that, that was top of mind. Did they, were they very, very well versed in handling complex investigations and in those parts of the world? Because again, everything is, um, well, there's, there's a tremendous cultural influence, so to speak. So uh, did, did I address your question there? Well, you you gave us a great example of how you're able to take the information that the client provides you, right. uh, have your gross or your large pool of technically competent uh, potential candidates, and then you start the process of drilling down as to which candidate may be or is the most appropriate for this client in this situation. And you gave us a great example of the technical skill part but I've heard you talk before, Maurice, and um, frankly, you always talk about the soft skills and right. developing. So when you talk to me, you say, Tom, you know, you need to, to, you need to think about your soft skills. So uh, my, my suspicion is that that is, if not equally important, may even be more important for a lot of the positions that you're filling due to their uh, C-suite level nature or at least high profile nature in the company. And how, how do you evaluate a candidate's soft skills, and then put that evaluation up against what the client may need? Uh, again, great question. Because here's a truism, and I think you've heard me say this before, as much as 80% of the hiring decision is not based on technical proficiency, but based on these soft skills. And because we represent and are filling very senior level positions, these um, include basically the ability to connect, the executive presence, these type of things. The, the ability also to recruit and to manage a staff. So a, a, a great component of our screening of professionals relates to these things. 
do they have an, an executive presence, both physically and when they uh, open their mouth? Um, do they have the ability to shape and influence others? Because that's what compliance officers do. They educate, they shape, they influence. Um, and then, of course, they, they have to uh, supervise a staff. And, and we ask questions about <clears throat> how do they go about recruiting staff and developing staff, things of this nature. So after you um, take a look at the technically proficient candidates and, and then move to your analysis of the soft skills mm -hmm. that a candidate may have or may be able to deliver to a, a specific um, uh, client or situation, are there any other steps in the presentation to candidates that you go through? Yeah, a very important step is we have to find out why they may consider the opportunity, what, what we call the hook. So what we ask a professional who we deem apparently qualified, both technically and with the soft skills, we ask this important question, why might you consider leaving your present employer or ask differently, is there anything about your current position that may not continue to meet your career needs? Without that, there's nowhere to go. You don't know how to help them, in other words. But if they do identify, and there's usually something there because no opportunity is perfect, but once you identify what might be lacking, then that is, quote, the hook, and that's something that needs to be vetted throughout the interview process. So here's a case in point. We were vetting um, or actually screening one professional, um, and this was a senior director position, and the individual said, well, I'd like to get gain more international exposure because that will help me eventually position myself to be a chief compliance officer. Well, as it turns out, that's what the opportunity was all about that we were searching for. It had an international component to it. And so therein was the hook. So you have to ask that question. It's very important because you have to know that <clears throat> what the client is looking for and then um, and, and the candidate. So once we get that data point, we also have to articulate that to the client and make sure that they address that head on in, in the interview process. Make sense? It does. It does. So um, it sounds like that, that you and Concilium go through a, a fairly lengthy internal, internal process to not only evaluate potential candidates, but then actually interview potential candidates uh, to determine really the right candidate for the right job for the right client. Is that a fair summation? Sure, absolutely. Everything is very, very deliberate and very strategic. Uh, there's, there's hours and, and hundreds of hours that go into a search because it's very complex. You don't, this is not something where you pick up the phone, you make a few phone calls, and, and boom, you have the the, the individual who's going to be right for your client. That's way too simplistic. Uh, each search averages about easily 250 to 300 hours because it's so intense what you have to go through, um, the, the volume of people you have to talk to, you have to screen uh, to see if they're appropriate. And, and then, of course, there's other elements of the search that we're going to get into in some other modules, but it, this is very, very labor-intensive, very it sounds, labor intensive. It sounds like you're describing almost a funnel process where obviously you start out with a large number of uh, potential, and then you have to winnow that down 
and winnow that down, and you have to do it through really uh, not only old-fashioned legwork, but a, a, a fairly detailed interview process after you have reviewed the, the written resume or other uh, uh, indicia of technical proficiency to, to come up with uh, a, at least a list of potential candidates. Uh, absolutely, because no client wants to basically review more than five professionals. So it's our job to whittle that down and present the best of the best. That's when we're doing our job appropriately. It's not up to our clients to spend additional time. In other words, we don't present 15 professionals for an opportunity. That wouldn't be doing our job correctly. We have to be present the best of the best, and we have to lessen the time that our clients are involved uh, because they're busy. They're busy conducting business. It's our job to whittle down the best of the best and present them in a nice, short, succinct manner so that our, our clients could uh, initiate the interview process. So now that you've been able to synthesize the best of the best, is that the point you present the uh, list to your client, or are there other steps before no. you get uh, once Once we're comfortable that we have a great short list, which would be no more than five, um, then we will present these professionals for our clients' consideration and buy-in and commence the interview process, which I believe is going to be the subject of one of our uh, follow-up modules. It is, and frankly, that's probably a good stopping point um, because we are going to go into some fairly uh, interesting and very important information on the interview process. So with that, I think uh, we will end this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. We are continuing our conversation with Maurice Gilbert on the A to Z of hiring and compliance. So Maurice, thanks very much, and I look forward to continuing our conversation. I as well, Tom. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. I have two calls to action for you. First, if you could go to iTunes and rate this podcast, I would greatly appreciate it. The second thing is, if you have any questions you'd like answered, I'm developing my next mailbag episode and would love to uh, be able to answer your question in a podcast. So please send, uh, send me any questions you might have that you'd like answered at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening.